Ladies and gentlemen, as president of the Hague Institute for Global Justice, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this distinguished speaker event. We also have the privilege of welcoming a former Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Uwe Rosenthal, uh, for whose support for the Institute we are most grateful, and uh, Mr. Van Ekelen, a former Minister of Defense, who is also a strong supporter of the Institute. This afternoon, it is a particular honor to welcome Miroslav Lajcek, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic. Minister Lajcek is the very model of a modern European minister, having represented not only his own country at the highest levels, but also served as a senior official in the foreign policy apparatus of the European Union. His lifetime of diplomatic experience was brought to bear in Brussels, where he served as personal representative of the High Representative for Common Foreign and Security Policy to facilitate the referendum on the independence of Montenegro, as well as High Representative and EU Special Representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina. EU enlargement is a subject on which Foreign Minister Lajcek is uniquely qualified to speak. Not only does he now represent Slovakia, a country along with nine others, currently celebrating its 10th anniversary as an EU member state, he has also held portfolios within the European External Action Service, including as the chief EU negotiator for the association agreements with Ukraine and Moldova which concerned the gradual economic integration, deepening of political cooperation, and the promotion of shared values within the EU's Eastern Partnership. We are fortunate in the timing of Minister Lajcek's remarks at the Institute. Today, beginning here in the Netherlands and in the United Kingdom, voters will go to the polls to elect the members of a new European Parliament. Concluding with Slovakia and 19 other countries on Sunday, we will soon know the political contours of Europe for the rest of the decade. The results of this election may also weigh heavily, for the first time, on the selection of the next President of the European Commission, and no doubt on the whole College of Commissioners, whose influence over issues including the EU's neighbourhood policy and possible future enlargement is critical. The 2004 enlargement of the European Union was heralded by many as the greatest success in its external relations, but is also seen as one of the greatest challenges for the EU's internal cohesion. The fears about the economic and cultural effects that expansion of the European Union has entailed and which further enlargement may accelerate have been voiced by people across the continent, particularly in older EU member states, where fears around competition for scarce jobs abound. It remains to be seen how voters who will arrive at the polls over the next few days will answer the question, EU enlargement, blessing or curse? Those of us who continue to believe that the European Union has been a peerless guarantor of peace and prosperity and appreciate, in the words of the 2012 Nobel Peace Prize Committee, its role in the transformation of most of Europe from a continent of war to a continent of peace must not shy away from this debate. His willingness to tackle the issue so directly today is a reminder that Miroslav Lajcek is among those best placed to convey the benefits of enlargement and of the European project more generally. We very much look forward to the Minister's lecture this afternoon, which, may I add, is of particular interest for the Hague Institute, given our own program of work on Eastern and Southeast Europe. Indeed, on Monday, in this room, we will continue a high-level dialogue with a distinguished speaker event featuring Edi Rama, the Prime Minister of Albania. This event comes at a critical time 
given the European Union's imminent decision on EU candidate status for Albania. You are all most welcome to join us for that event, as are you, Minister Lajcek. Uh, now, though, uh, it is my honor to invite you, Minister, to take the stage. Mr. President, thank you very much for your nice introduction. Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really pleased to be here with you and to speak about the European Union and the enlargement. I have to confess, though, that my knees started shaking when I saw so many political and diplomatic heavyweights in the audience, Ministers Rosenthal van Eckel and ICJ President Peter Tomka, ICTY Chief Prosecutor, Steve, Bra uh, sorry, uh, Serge Brammertz, and the others. So I'll, all I can do is to promise that I'll try not to disappoint you. I'm really pleased that we have the chance to speak about European Union, and there are several reasons for that. First, at least I, for a while, I don't have to finger and speak about Ukraine, which has been my dominant preoccupation in last month. Second, helps me to point out to the fact that for the last 20 years, the European Union and the enlargement has been uh, in the focus of my country's attention and my personal attention, and I had a unique experience to be part of the, this process from different perspectives. First, looking through the fence, inside, standing outside myself, being a candidate country, part of the process. Second, joining the European Union, being a member state and seeing the world from a different perspective from within, and third, being a European Union myself, having the honor to, to work uh, on behalf of the European Union, either in the field in the Balkans, in Montenegro, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, or also in the headquarters in Brussels. Another good reason to speak about European Union and enlargement is the fact that, as it was mentioned already, today is the day when this country, the Netherlands, is voting its, its members of the future European Parliament. And the last good reason to speak about enlargement is the fact that the Netherlands belongs to the six founding members of the European Union or European Community, which also means that it uh, belongs among the six only out of 28 members of the European Union that has not been part of the enlargement process themselves. <laughs> the fact is that about 60 years after the first steps were taken, the European Union is now a viable, unique, and a successful project. And during these decades, thanks to the European integration, Europe has become safer, more prosperous, and a global player. Safer because we live in a stable and peaceful Europe, and although Europe, Europe is not primarily about security, it has a strong geopolitical impact. Prosperous because despite the economic crisis that we have been going through in the last five years, the European Union is still an economic heavyweight. Let, let us remind ourselves that the EU represents the largest economy in the world, is the largest common market in the world, is the largest donor in the world, in, is the largest investor in the most parts of the world, and is also the largest recipient of foreign direct investments. And a global player, because the weight of the United European Union has grown, and especially after the 2004 Big Bang enlargement, which brought a crucial shift to the European Union, I would dare to say that it trans transferred from a regional power into a global one. With Central Europe on board, the European Union is, uh, has now the geopolitical weight that puts it in a, into a different category. Unfortunately, recently we have been forced to focus on some other, more pressing issues. We had to deal with the consequences of the financial and economic crisis, and this has put many other agendas on the back burner to some extent, and the uh, European Union's internal problems consume too much of our time and energy. And regrettably or ironically, it, it has to become the Ukrainian crisis that uh, reminded all of us that there is an outside world out, outside of the European Union. There is li life outside of the European Union. Still, if there is one policy that has worked successfully throughout the whole process of European unif unification that has taken place in several waves, in different settings, and under different conditions, then it is the enlargement policy. Enlargement has been, in fact, an indivisible part of the evolution of the European Union. Without the enlargement, 
there would not be the European Union as we know it today. It has significantly contributed to the changes Europe has been undergoing in recent decades. There is no wonder it is widely recognized as one of the most successful EU policies. And uh, as I said already at the beginning, since the 50s, this has been a continuous process when Europe and expanded from six to the current 28 members. Moreover, even the hard times for the European Union, it, the enlargement maintained it, its attractiveness and therefore also its relevance. And in today's European Union's waiting room, there, the, it's not empty. We have five candidate countries and we have few more aspirants, those who are willing to become candidate countries and future member, member states. In the light of the crisis we have been through recently, the question might come and is coming to one's mind, how is it possible that the European Union is still attractive? So I'll try to give you some answers. First, the European Union is the best model of integration. And this is the question I ask many times, many people who particularly recently like to complain about the European U Union. Uh, and I ask them, give me a better, better functioning model in this real world that has delivered more political stability, economic prosperity, and better level of protection of, of human rights and other rights. There is no better functioning club of the countries on this planet. Second, there is no country in the European Union that wouldn't have benefited from its membership in the European Union. To put it bluntly, enlargement is neither charity nor humanitarian assistance. This has never been a one-way street. Both sides have always benefited from the enlargement. Third, not many EU policies have such visible impact for the European Union itself, as well as for the countries involved. On the side of the European Union, it brought further stability, economic growth, and expansion the area of European values. On the side of the countries involved, countries accessing to the European Union, it meant reforms, EU standards, best practices, and EU freedoms, of course. My fourth answer is that the enlargement is not the only one and is not the final objective. It's the process itself that is important. Everybody knows that it is demanding and time-consuming. The goal of joining the European Union is a unique opportunity to introduce systemic reforms and game-changing measures that would probably not have been feasible without the perspective of membership. And fifth, every single enlargement blew a fresh wind into the European Union and was an impulse for both new and old members. Enlargement is also very closely connected with the famous soft power of the European Union. That means enlargement policy is in fact one of the most tangible expressions of the European Union's soft power. The biggest strength of the European Union is the, its ability and its willingness to lead by example. This ability to inspire is one of the things that make the European Union foreign, foreign policy special. The secret lies in the fact that we do not transform the countries. We inspire and support them to transform themselves. And this has been proven in several rounds of enlargement so far. In the South European countries after getting rid of their own dictatorships in the 70s, in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Iron Curtain, and currently we are witnessing the same effect in the Balkans. At the same time, we must be aware that our soft power has been weakened lately. Why? First, because our partners in the global arena understand that we have been going through problems, through crises, but they have difficulties to understand how come we are so self-centered. How come we consume so much time and energy with our internal and quite often self-destructive disputes, as if there is nothing else but us and our problems? Second, it is a well-known formula that in times of economic crisis, egoism, nationalism, xenophobia, and radicalism gain strength, and we are all witnesses to these factors. And I'm sad to see that this is happening in the European Union, while it is obvious that everybody benefited from, from the enlargement, not only in economic numbers, but also in terms of political stability, security, social interaction between Europeans, etc. And the third reason is that we, may, we must bear in mind that European soft power, in terms of our foreign policy, is based on us promoting principles, values and rules, promoting human rights, democracy, rule of law, international law. This is the core of our soft power. 
In other words, every time we start to promote one party against the other, every time we are seen as taking sides rather than protecting principles and values, of course, our soft power is weakened. It is therefore important to build our European foreign engagement on well-proven models, and enlargement policy certainly belongs among them. Now let me elaborate more on the latest achievements of the enlargement policy. The first point is the consolidation of post-Cold War Europe. The fall of communism and the collapse of the Soviet Union created a fundamentally new situation in the, in the Central and Eastern Europe. The following transformation was an amazing success in terms of scope, depth, and speed. All of this would be hardly imaginable without prospects of the EU and NATO membership. Clear European perspective was the light at the end of the tunnel for all of us. Often it seems that in the European Union we are unable to appreciate enough the influence this process had on us, on former candidate countries and current member states. But if we want to get a clearer picture, let's look a bit further to the east. Look at what is happening in Ukraine these days. And look at Belarus, so I, I don't have to go any further. But this, this situation, which is really happening just beyond our borders, reminds us that stability and security we enjoy in the European Union cannot be taken for granted. The second achievement I want to mention is the consolidation of the Balkans after the Balkan Wars. The Balkans demonstrates that enlargement policy is still relevant and the European Union's power to inspire and to transform still works. Or to put it vice versa, can anybody imagine what would the Balkans look like without the European perspective? Stabilization in the Balkans is directly proportional to the success in enlargement. That means more progress in enlargement means more stability and prosperity. And there are clear examples on both sides. Croatia, Montenegro on the positive side, Bosnia and Herzegovina on the negative side. The situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina is really worrying and needs to be addressed urgently. The question is how? But that's a dif different story for a different lecture. Last but not least, the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue would be impossible without the European perspective for the whole region. So no one can deny the positive influence of this perspective and also of this dialogue. Enlargement policy transformed the whole continent into a community of values because it's based on Copenhagen criteria, which in many aspects address the fundamental qualities of the modern European society. That is political system based on stable democratic institutions, rule of law, human rights, and market economy. Today, when the European project is facing significant challenges from outside, such as Ukraine, and also from inside, such as populism or radicalism, it is a good opportunity to reconfirm these criteria and to support the enlargement policy that embodies the European Union's unique transformative power. But as I said, the enlargement is not a one-way street, and I would like to address now the two most favorite anti-enlargement myths. The first is the misappropriation of the EU funds, or the notion of us paying for them, for nothing. Well, the facts prove that even the net payers to the Europe EU budget are better off thanks to the enlargement. If we take into account the GDP increase as a result of the common market expansion and new investment opportunities. In addition, we need to differentiate between the cause and the effect and avoid to mixing up the impact of the enlargement and the financial crisis. As a matter of fact, during the financial and economic crisis, Central Europe remained one of the growth engines of the entire European Union. The second popular myth is migration. The truth is that there is relatively little mobility within the European Union. Annual cross-border mobility rate in the European Union is only 0.29%. These figures are very low as compared to the United States, for example, where this rate is almost 10 times, 10 times higher, 2.4%. And apart from that, reputable studies show that migrant workers can boost the host country's GDP considerably. The European Commission reported twice on what impact mobility of workers from the so-called new member states had on the labor markets of the other countries. And both reports found that free movement of workers is overwhelmingly positive for the economy and did not have any serious negative side effects on the labor market. I speak about facts and figures. Now a few words about the, this issue of enlargement from my national, from Slovakian perspective. 
Here I'm happy to say that my country belongs to those that have benefited the most from its membership. After the split of Czechoslovakia in 1993, the European Union and NATO accession became our top priority. And what is crucial, there has been a unique consensus on European agenda in my country from the very beginning and throughout the process. That's very important. Some of you probably remember that our way to the European Union was not easy, particularly in the 90s. I'm not going to elaborate on this now here. But uh, what I want to stress is that this meant one thing. We needed to work even harder, harder than other candidate countries. And eventually, in 2004, we not, uh, not only managed to join the European Union together with our neighbors, but we belong among the best prepared new member states. And this was confirmed in the years to come. Our successful catch-up in the accession process created a unique momentum in our society as well as in our politics, and this even accelerated our effort further. So we joined the Schengen in 2007 and then the Eurozone in 2009 as the first post-communist country. In this regard, we not only managed to fulfill our obligations from the accession treaty, but to put it simply, in a little bit than 10 years, we made it from a renegade, from a black hole of Europe to the very core of the European integration. No success is easy to achieve, and in our case, it meant necessary, but also very often very painful transformation. This included introduction of unpopular reforms, unprecedented in scope and depth. It, I suppose they would be hardly imaginable in what we, what we call the old member states. Just compare it with the lack of willingness to introduce important reforms before or during the financial crisis in some countries of the European Union. A clear vision clear European perspective provided by the enlargement served as a crucial incentive for us, for politicians and for the populations. For politicians to take the risk and eventually to pay the political price for introducing reforms, and for the population to accept these harsh reforms. One example for all, all reform of our banking sector in Slovakia. We have stabilized our banking sector, we have invested hundreds of millions of euro from our own packet, amounting to 11% of our GDP. But it well paid off, because at the beginning of the financial crisis, our banks in Slovakia have been extremely stable, and uh, they have been uh, not part of the problem, uh, but on the contrary, helped to stabilize the, the banking system and the discussion about the banking system in Europe. So this is a proof that hard and well-prepared reforms bring the revenue that supports and stabilize the entire society, and in particular, the business environment. And also thanks to this stability, Slovakia enjoyed one of the most dynamic growth in Europe in the last decade. After 10 years, time has come to take stock of our membership, and this is exactly what we have been doing in previous days when we were celebrating 10 years of our successful EU membership. And, and we did some re research on, on that occasion, and our evaluation shows that the last decade has been a real success story for Slovakia, not only in terms of growing GDP, but also in terms of modernizing our society, infrastructure, schools, hospitals, social services, etc. Equally importantly, this evaluation shows that Slovakia has become fully integrated into the European Union, not only in institutional terms, but also in terms of economy. Let me uh, point out the fact that 83% of our exports goes to the countries of the European Union, 90% of the foreign direct investment in Slovakia comes from the European Union. In terms of legislation, a significant part of our legislation, some 80% of our national legislation, represents a transposition of European acquis. And also in terms of development, because up to 80% of our all public investment in my country are co-financed through the European Union funds. So today, in my country, even the firmest skeptics have to admit that there is no real alternative to the EU membership. As a result of our accession process, and uh, as a result of the fact, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we have an experience from both sides of the fence, we are familiar with both difficulties and benefits. That's why, on the one hand, we wish everybody who so wishes in Europe to have the same chance as we had, to transform and modernize its state and society, to experience Euro European solidarity, to enjoy European freedoms and prosperity. And this is the reason why we are resolute advocates for further European Union's enlargement. But at the same time, no one can fool us. We have been through all this. We know what it takes. We know how painful it can be. 
And therefore, we do not hesitate to strongly criticize candidate countries if they do not deliver results, if they do not do what they promise to do. The fact is that the European Union enlargement is anything but finished. We cannot conclude it without full integration of the Western Balkans. This will, of course, not happen overnight, but there is no alternative to further enlargement. It is only a matter of time when another Western Balkan country will follow Croatia. We see this as absolutely crucial to have the region fully on board. Security and stability in Europe has been always interlinked with the Balkans. Speaking for Slovakia, we will continue to help these countries to find the right path to progress and to uh, integrate further. But we know very well, and we keep repeat this to our partners and friends in the Balkans, the homework can only be done at home. No one can do your homework instead of you. Of course, it would be foolish and it would be a mistake to paint the enlargement picture only in bright colors. Speaking about blessing or curse, as is the title of my presentation, would probably be too strong, but enlargement certainly is about opportunities as well as challenges. It is about chances and risks. Enlargement highlighted several issues. First, we need to keep the Club of 28 and possibly more in the future truly operational and responsive not only to global trends, but also to internal developments and growing multitude of interests of member states and their citizens. Second, keeping citizens' interest on our radar screens is essential, yet becoming more and more difficult, because the larger the European Union is, the more democratic legitimacy it needs. Third, we need to have the subsidiarity principle not on paper, but in real life. We need to improve the EU legislation so that it works in favor of the European Union competitiveness, rather than as an ammunition to the Eurosceptics or even anti-EU populists. And last but not least, promoting European unity versus providing room for multi-speed Europe became a crucial riddle of successful integration, because the Europe as we see today is really a multi-speed Europe, and we have to make sure that everybody feels involved and everybody is part of the decisions we make. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand that not everybody is as convinced and as enthusiastic about the enlargement as I am, but to conclude, let me mention some facts for those who are worried. First, as I already said, accession process of the enlargement itself is not the final goal. It is just the beginning and it is an opportunity. I don't understand why should we worry to start something that we own, start something that is in our hands, start something that can eventually prepare candidate countries that have the potential to strengthen the European Union. Launching the process that does not necessarily implicate the successful conclusion. But keep in mind that every well-prepared candidate country is a unique contribution for the European Union. We should be prepared to work with that. Second, European perspective is clearly defined in the Treaty on the European Union, and let's not forget that this treaty states that, I quote, any European state which represents the values referred to in Article 2 and is committed to promoting them may apply to become a member of the Union, end quote. All Western Balkan countries, and by the way, also the countries of the Eastern Partnership, meet the geographic criterion. It is also in our interest to ensure that they comply also with the value part of the treaty. Third, let's not be afraid to let the EU's transformative soft power work in the European Union's direct neighborhood. Results achieved in the Central Europe are a good example of what can be achieved. For example, today the Visegrad four countries are a growth engine for the European Union, and we often bring one voice to Brussels instead of four, and I believe I can say that we are part of the solution rather than part of the problems the European Union is facing. The 2004 Big Bang enlargement is indeed a good example of strengthening the European Union. Expanding the club from 15 to 25 member states and increasing the European population by almost 75 million contributed greatly to further building strong Europe. Six out of 10 members are in the Eurozone today. Six out of 10 already chaired the European Union Council and managed to deliver, deliver solid results. EU GDP per capita at market prices in 2012 was 18% higher than in 2004. And let me tell you that in case of Slovakia, the difference is even higher, it's 58%. 
So any discussion about the old and new member states is becoming relevant only for historians today. Today we should speak only about two categories of states, responsible and irresponsible. And also from this viewpoint, I really believe that the so-called newcomers from Central and Eastern Europe are a contribution rather than a burden for the European Union. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Eurosceptic voices are heard louder and louder nowadays, basically throughout the whole Europe. In a couple of days, we will find out what the new, new European Parliament will look like. It is very likely that Eurosceptics or even extremist and radical parties will be represented in the European Parliament more than ever before. In times of crisis, people tend to believe in simple and fast solutions, solutions that populists often offer, be it in the Netherlands or anywhere else. We should not be naive. There are no such solutions that would solve anything overnight. Enlargement and immigration are usually first to be blamed for everything bad. Therefore, it's very important from my point of view that we don't allow to fool ourselves, for instance, by, by terms such as enlargement fatigue, because there is no such thing. Let's not the enlargement become a victim of populists and of the financial crisis. Let's not the enlargement become a victim of domestic politics. Modern European history shows that it brings positive results for all of us. I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister, for that uh, stimulating uh, speech. Um, you've made a, a very a powerful case for the benefits of enlargement, uh, and you underline that security and stability in Europe uh, has always been linked to uh, stability in the Balkans. As the Foreign Minister of a country which joined the EU 10 years ago, what advice would you give to aspiring member states? What, for example, should be our counsel to the Prime Minister of Albania, who, as I said, will speak at the Hague Institute on Monday? Work hard. Don't be afraid of taking pain. Have a vision and communicate this vision upon your population. <coughs> Stick to the rules. There are no shortcuts. There are no discounts. But this last applies also to us, to the European Union. Stick to the rules. So it means if we have defined the rules for the process, let's respect this, these rules. And if someone meets the criteria, let's honor our part of the commitment. Mm -hmm. um, you also um, <coughs> underlined uh, in your remarks that in times of crisis, particularly financial or economic crisis, xenophobia, uh, becomes a real threat, and you challenged uh, a number of myths, <coughs> including myths surrounding uh, migration. Do, quote-unquote, northern European countries have legitimate concerns about unrestricted immigration from newer member states? And is it a reasonable step to restrict access to their benefit systems, as has been suggested in Britain? No. In, there might have been fears, there might have been myth before this actually happened. But uh, now we have the real facts on the ground and real figures. And we see that not only the membership of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, but also uh, the lifting of the visa requirement for the countries of the Balkans did not change the geographic map or, or of the European Union. Uh, those who wanted to go, they, they left even before. Uh, the situation is stabilized. What is relevant and important, so I don't want to dismiss this issue completely, is that we shall not allow misusing the social system. So that means that we, we shall not encourage the, the so-called social, so social migration. We, it, let's make sure, but this can be easily dealt with by amending the national legislation. <coughs> if people are misusing the, the visa requirements uh, you change, you, you change your policy. If people are misusing the, your, your social system, you change the policy. You, you don't blame the European Union, you don't blame the enlargement process. You can address this. Those who 
work should be entitled to get the part of the benefits, those who have come clearly only to misuse the, the, the higher standards of living, there is, there is a way and it's not so difficult to define the way how to address this issue. Mm -hmm. um, as we mentioned at the outset, the elections for the European Parliament are now on the way. Um, if the polls are to be believed, and we have quite a number of different polls, um, the extreme parties are supposed to be, do quite well. Um, how should European politicians deal with this predicted lead in support for extreme parties in this weekend's European elections? Well, these elections are important because these are the elections where uh, our citizens will give uh, us, the governments in the European Union member states, the grades, their assessment for the way we have been dealing with the crisis. And unfortunately, it comes at the end of the painful and difficult five-year long period of the crisis, when people felt the negative impact of the crisis on all aspects of their personal life. I understand that they ha have reasons to be angry. Uh, I still hope that they will be able to distinguish between those who are telling the truth, uh, even though it's uh, not always convenient to hear, and those who are professing the easy way out, because there is no easy way out from the difficult situation. Uh, yes, I think it's le legitimate to expect that uh, the share of the populist, xenophobic, nationalistic and anti-EU parties and movements in the European Parliament after these elections will increase. But I, I'm also sure that it will not increase to the amount that would significantly prevent the, the Parliament from performing on, on its responsibilities. And the responsibilities have really increased after the Lisbon Treaty. So every time someone comes with criticism, I just suggest to ask him, OK, what's the answer? What's, what's, what's the better way? And, and th this helps us to, to see whether the people have s serious agendas, serious proposals, serious ad ideas, or it's only uh, about riding the wave of populism. Mm -hmm. You noted um, in your reflections about Ukraine that Ukraine was a powerful reminder that there is a world beyond uh, the EU which can be a rather dangerous world. Uh, since the Lisbon Treaty, a mutual defense clause like Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty applies between the member states. But do you think that the European Union is doing enough for the security of its eastern member states? Well, the European Union is not primarily uh, here to deal with the security uh, of its members. So most of us are members of NATO for that purpose. Uh, the fact is that especially after the crisis started, we have really been completely self-absorbed in disputes about the, about the crisis. We were painting the picture more bleak than it really was. Uh, our part and I asked myself a couple of times, how can we aspire to be a global player when we uh, tend to ignore what is happening around us because we have no time to look around us because we are all time spending dealing with our internal problems, uh, which we portray in a more serious colors than they are seen from outside of the European Union. I asked about uh, what message are we sending to the countries in our neighborhood, to the countries to whom we promised the European perspective. And now we are sending signals, we don't care about you because we are too busy with ourselves. If we are to be a real global player, and we are a global player, we have to act like one, including to make sure that we are actively seized on global agendas. Uh, Ukraine is a global issue, a global concern now. Uh, I don't think that uh, in it, it affects and it will affect our, so to say, hard security. I don't think uh, anybody is threatening our, our security as such. But of course, we are being heavily affected in terms of international law being violated, uh, increased uh, level of criminal activities in our uh, close neighborhood, and of course, the negative impact of the overall situation the first of, uh, set of sanctions we've imposed 
and even more so the, the prospects of further sanctions, the horizontal economic sanctions. So all this is extremely serious in today's globalized world when everything is interlinked and intertwined. So uh, I believe that our role, our responsibility, uh, our meaning uh, as politicians is to de-escalate, to calm down the situation and to do all we can to find a political solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. Given uh, the political, economic and social realities uh, in Europe, uh, how do you see the European Union developing five or ten years from now in terms of both membership and institutions? First, multi-speed Europe has become a reality but should not be a permanent solution. European Union should not turn into a train with the coaches of first class and second class. There is a group, a core group, Eurozone, that adopts the decisions which affect also those who are not part of the group and therefore not part of the decision-making uh, process. Uh, but it does not mean that they should be cut off the, this decision-making process. Second, the crisis showed that uh, we went too far in certain aspects of integration and uh, we have delegated the competencies to the Brussels institutions also in the areas where nation states are comfortable of dealing with these issues and therefore I welcome the discussions such as the one here in the Netherlands to review in a way the, 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 the list of competencies and to see if uh, uh, some of them cannot be redelegated back to the national level. But of course it has to be done on the EU, EU level, not on the one country versus the rest of the EU level. It must not be picking and choosing. EU is an, a contract among the 28 and not the uh, 28 individual contracts between the country and Brussels. But at the same time the crisis showed clearly that we did not integrate far enough in number of crucial areas, monetary policy, of course, the, the, the banks, banking operations. And this is what has been already identified, the famous four pillars of Herman Van Rompuy. This is what we are trying to implement. So it's not the exercise for the sake of exercise, but it's to make sure that we address problems before they grow too heavy uh, and too difficult. We are able to indicate, we are able to act, we are able to prevent, we must also be able to act every time some of our member states do not comply with our co commitments, stability pact mm -hmm. uh, and the fiscal pact and the others. So that's, that's really important. This is on the internal side. On the external side, I want to see the European Union that is giving clear signals that it cares about its neighborhood, it cares about the peace, stability in the world, European Union, which is not part of the problem, but European Union, which, as I said in my presentation, is a protector of democratic standards and values. European Union that keeps the vision of future membership for the countries of the Western Balkans tangible and viable, because without that there is no chance that they can go through all these painful reforms. And we are fair in judging and assessing their progress. So I don't want to speak about dates, it's always tricky but the process should, should be kept alive because, again, my question, what's the alternative? We cannot slum close the door. The countries are here and they need to know where they, they have the chance to be in 10 years from now. Good. Well, thank you, Foreign Minister. I would like to give an the audience an opportunity to engage in dialogue with you. Um, I would ask, I think we have the roving mics, uh, just to, I'll take questions in sets of three to okay. give uh, as many uh, uh, people in the audience Provided to pose there are questions. Three questions, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so just raise your, your hand and, and yes, we'll go first to the ambassador of Ukraine and then former defense minister and then... Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, Unfortunately, fortunately, Ukraine will be the part <laughs> I, I <knew> <laughs> of your lecture. And uh, uh, I have noticed that during your speech you said that for you have gone through all the stages in order to become the member of the European Union. So at one stage, 
the membership was a kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. Don't you think that Europe was wrong in not giving this light at the end of the tunnel to Ukraine when Ukraine asked and urged and was uh, crying to give it? Because uh, I know from my personal meetings here, so we say, okay, look, this is the issue of the geostrategy. So you can put a final nail into the coffin of the Soviet Union. But it wasn't done. So now we are facing the situation. So probably it is not the challenge of Ukrainian events to Europe, it's the challenge of the geostrategic uh, rivalry, which is the part of the problem which, you, which Europe is facing now. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, former Defense Minister Van Ekelen. Thanks. First, congratulations, Minister, for a wonderful speech, but I think also congratulations with the success of your country. Thank you. When I visited you 20 years ago, uh, there were some question marks. You were in a nationalistic phase. Yes. Um, you could have problems with your neighbors, and in that context, I think the, uh, uh, the, the enlargement with all the candidate countries at that time was a great success, also for you, uh, because it created a zone of stability, as you rightfully said. But also, we had the question mark about the economic situation, yeah. because we all thought, well, Slovakia is a country with too much heavy industry, they will have uh, quite a problem. But you did very well, and in a way, it was a, uh, it was a miracle. Now, Thank as you, you said, um, we had a financial crisis. I personally believe that uh, through every crisis, EU comes out a little better, uh, also a little more integrated. But what do you think is the next step? Is that an energy policy? Uh, because this summer, uh, we may have an energy crisis when Russia stops gas uh, to Ukraine because they can't pay. Uh, and uh, so in that respect. And the other element, which I, you mentioned values, but I think in the Netherlands, the main problem with further enlargement is doubts about the rule of law in the candidate countries. And I think for us, that will be a critical element. Uh, uh, there are myths, as you said, about crime being imported, etc., which is probably exaggerated, but in the public, I think rule of law, and perhaps in this house, <laughs> President, I think it's good to emphasize that. Okay. Thank you. And a third question, the gentleman next to the ambassador of Ukraine. Thank you so much. Jaap de Zwaan from the The Hague University. And I had the pleasure in the early stage of my career to lecture a lot in your country after the elections of 97, by the way. I, um, uh, I, I have, in fact, a question which is a little bit connected to the one of the uh, Ukrainian ambassador. And that's indeed the objectives from the perspective of the EU with regard to Eastern partnership. On the one hand, we try to convince these countries to take over our norms, values, and even our policies. On the other hand, we envisage Eastern partnership as an alternative for membership. It's a bit putting the question in a different manner, but don't you think that's a little bit contradictory when you uh, present yourself in such a way to countries which are, which have a European origin? Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll try to answer the first and the last question together because it's practically the one question. And yes, this is, this is a serious issue and I think it's clear that we will have to rethink our Eastern policy now. Uh, Eastern partnership is a well-meant policy of the European Union that uh, tries to offer as much as the EU is ready to offer political association, economic integration, visa liberalization. I like 
saying that the European Union is an organism rather than a mechanism and we also go through different stages of our internal developments and the list of our priorities is uh, uh, also sometimes fluid. So there, there was an enlargement enthusiasm. It's not here anymore. We understand our responsibility, but let's face, face it, the fact is that European Union is not ready, was not ready, and still is not ready to offer clear European perspective for our Eastern partners. So what the best what could be offered and was offered is, the, is an open-ended process. That means it does not guarantee the membership, but it does not exclude it either. And uh, we like telling you, so the end game of this process is not what we give to you, but what you make out of it. Sounds good, but doesn't work that good, honestly. Particularly after this process has been identified by the Russian Federation as a hostile process. And I'm not trying to accuse anyone. It was not meant to be a geopolitical competition about Ukraine, Belarus, other countries between the European Union and, and the Russian Federation. It was meant, and I really believe uh, in what I'm saying, as an expansion of the zone of stability uh, in our neighborhood, in our common neighborhood, in uh, uh, ex also well, increasing the level of European values in all uh, your countries and strengthen the pred predictability of the development if you're in your countries. But we are no longer in that stage. Russia has made it clear, and I'm not judging whether it is right or wrong, but Russia has made it clear that uh, signing of association agreements and DCFTA part in particular is seen as an unacceptable step from, or hostile activity because as they uh, assert, it's, uh, it causes negative effect on their own economy, on their own trade. They have not been part of this exercise, they have not been consulted on the impact, so they have right to act. And you have, uh, of course, suffered these acts and you have seen this. So what, what next? I mean, we need to... Five years after the Eastern, Eastern Partnership Policy has been launched, we need to sit down and to have a very honest, frank and political discussion about what next. Particularly, and... Uh, do we want the Eastern Partnership to be, and I have no answers to this question, but I feel this, this, these questions are here. Do we see the Eastern Partnership as a part of confrontation with Russia? Does Russia see the Eastern Partnership as a part of our confrontation with them? Are we ready to confront Russia in order to defend our Eastern Partnership policy? Are we not ready to confront Russia? What does it mean for the consequences of our Eastern Partnership policy? We are in different game now. We have not changed the rules of the game, but this is a different game. I, and I think we need to be honest with ourselves and to define what games are we in, in order to be able to agree on how are we going to play this game. So I, I wish I could give you a more encouraging answer, but I, I would be lying. This is how it is. And we are all trying to come to terms with what is happening. Of course, our first priority and the burning priority is to help calming down the situation in your country, to, to give it back to normalcy, to start the normal political processes, to support the democratic processes, of course, to, to protect, defend the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So this is not, this is not the time for or, or this uh, philosophical, I would say, exercise, but there is no runaway from, I mean, we will have to have this discussion. And we have seen uh, Armenia, uh, we have seen Ukraine, 27th of June, uh, we have already announced we are going to sign the association agreement DCFTA with Moldova and Georgia. We can only guess what the reactions will be, also on the Russian side. So what is important for me from the EU perspective is that we not only react to the events which are happening here and there, but we also see the wider picture. We know what game are we in, as I said, and we know what's our role and what our priorities in this game are.
on uh, Minister Van Eckelen's questions. Uh, next step on the EU side, as I said, we have the, the, the blueprint outlined by the President Van Rompuy, the four pillars. We have progressed well on the banking union, and it's logical, of course. Uh, you can not have one monetary policy and 17 or 18 different independent fiscal policies. That's obviously clear. Uh, we need to have a banking supervision. Well, I think no one questions that. Here the challenge is if we have the courage to act in case these rules are not applied or respected. Because we have had the rules and we have disrespected these rules and then we've paid the price. Uh, we speak about fiscal union. I don't think the European Union is ready to speak about economic union because it's, it's far reaching and, and we are not there. Uh, but energy has become uh, a, 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 an EU-wide issue. I remember at the time of the first gas crisis, 2009, uh, that the opinion on the side of the Commission was that this, is, this, this issue falls clearly within the competence of national states, national governments. No one claims this anymore. We have to deal with this. Issue of the energy security uh, has become a strategic issue, a security issue uh, for the entire European Union. So we are investing heavily in building no, uh, the north-south interconnectors and diversifying uh, not only the routes, but also supplies. And this is, a, this is important. And it will take not less than three years, but not more than five years. I guess, and we will have a totally different energy situation in Europe. And that means subsequently also a totally different position vis-a-vis -vis the Russian Federation here. Because there is a, uh, the, the demand prevails over supply, but, uh, sorry, on the contrary. There is more gas than there is a need for gas, but our problem is, of course, that we do not have infrastructure to get the gas where we need to get. So we are working on this. And this is the, this is the priority. No one should question that. And the doubts about the rule of law in the candidate countries, yes, I do not dare to judge to what extent it is uh, the truth and to what extent it is a perception. Uh, but we know that in politics, the perception is sometimes more important than the truth. So we have done what we could do, namely to put these two chapters of the accession process, 23 and 24, uh, into the center of our attention. We opened the negotiation process with opening these two chapters, and these chapters are kept open throughout the whole process, so they will be closed at the very end. And as I said, we, we own this process, so no one can force us to agree to closing them as long as we are not sure that uh, the countries have uh, met the European standards. At the same time, let's not be naive or let's not ex use this as an excuse for blocking the process because rule of law is a process, it's not an act. You cannot introduce rule of law in, in two weeks. But what is important is that throughout the process we see a clear improvement of the situation on the side of the institutions, on the side of the administrative capacity, on the side of the efficiency and, and everything. We must be sure that the country is moving in the right direction and the process is already irreversible. Because it would be not fair to demand from the countries now at this stage that you should introduce the highest possible European, say the Dutch or the Scandinavian level of the rule of law. No, they have to get there, as we have to get there, honestly speaking, uh, in our countries in Central Eastern Europe as well. Yes. Welcome. Good. Let me take another round of questions. Um, Mr. Chowdhury, the back, and then Serge Bremer, and one of the back. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, my name is Khaled Ahmed Chowdhury, and I'm from International Human Rights Commission. Please allow me to ask you uh, issues over human rights conditions in your own country. According to the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, there are grave concerns over the human rights issues in regard to Romas, segregation, uh, uh, separate uh, children's schools, forcing uh, Roma women for sterilization, and then 
another uh, question in regard to uh, migrants, immigrants, illegal immigrants being expelled from your country, but there are uh, many news about torture and ill treatment treatment of those uh, uh, people. So please let us know that being a European state and within the European Union, being champion of the human rights, can we tolerate these sort of uh, atrocities against the ethnic minorities? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, search, permits, yeah. Thank you, Sergio Brammertz, prosecutor from the ICTY. Uh, thank you very much for your very realistic uh, presentation. I think it's, it's important that we are not having a too idealistic view about the European Union, but are very down to earth. And I think your, your presentation was, was very much in, in line with this aspiration. I had a, a question in relation also to rule of law, um, former Yugoslavia in, in, in particular, uh, where over the last seven years we have the possibility to work there. We, we see some countries more progress than in others, uh, in Croatia and Serbia more than, than in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, it's, I find it always very disappointing for, for the friends and colleagues and hardworking people in, in, in Sarajevo and other countries, in, uh, in other uh, cities in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, that there is very little, little progress we see in relation to law enforcement, uh, war crimes investigations. And uh, unfortunately, I've also not the impression that politically it's really moving very strongly forward, where victims in Bosnia are very often complaining about that. They're yeah. saying, you know, we were one of the victims the most affected by the conflict, but if we see the EU enlargement process, we are really left behind. So my question is, I know it's a difficult one, but you, you spent uh, some time in, in Sarajevo. Uh, what do you think uh, will be the, the development in Bosnia Herzegovina, and what are the solutions for, for the problems we are still experiencing there? Thank you. Okay. And there's a, a third question, which we'll take uh, for the gentleman at the back, second to last row. Uh, one question from the back benches. So I would like to thank the, the Deputy Prime Minister for his speech. Also to thank the Hague Institute for Global Justice for inviting the Deputy Prime Minister. It's an excellent event. By doing this, by the way, the Hague Institute is somehow replacing Klingendal in organizing these public speeches. So my question is, is regarding the Western Balkans. I'm coming from, from the Balkans, and I would like to ask the Deputy Prime Minister, how does he reconcile the great concept of the enlargement of the EU and the role of the EU for the stabilization in the Western Balkans with the policy of non-recognition of Kosovo? So, in brief, when Slovakia is going to reconsider its policy with regard to Kosovo? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You have a number of easy questions, yeah. Foreign Minister. Uh, let me tell you that there has been no public presentation where I participated uh, without me being confronted with the issue of non-recognition of Kosovo. So I was waiting, I knew it was coming, I didn't know when and from where, but okay. it's a must, it's the most frequent question I get. And uh, uh, with your permission, I'll start with answering this question. Uh, as we all know, five members of the European Union have not recognized Kosovo uh, for their own national reasons. It's a fact which should be respected as we respect other countries' sensitivities and positions when it comes to other uh, issues. So I don't like when somebody else's position on some question is referred to as position. And in our case, it's called problem, uh, because we also have a right to have our position. I am a foreign minister, and I have to respect the fact that this was uh, a decision of our parliament which I have to respect. Uh, I want to stress very strongly that uh, this is not a position of hostility towards Kosovo. This is the position towards the process. Uh, and we strongly believe that uh, the issues such as uh, well, the creation of a new state 
should be either a result of the UN Security Council resolution or the result of an agreement between the two partners involved. Neither of these principles was followed in the case of Kosovo, so this is uh, why our parliament adopted the position as it is. But as I said, we have very active communication with Kosovo. We support the European perspective for Kosovo. We vote for all the European Union documents, uh, paving the way for the further progress on Kosovo's uh, European integration path. We have our office in Pristina. We are recognizing documents, we are issuing visas, we are meeting. Uh, they are coming regularly to Bratislava. So sometimes I ask, uh, or sometimes I say, the only thing which is missing is the flag. But the substance is here. There is so much we can do uh, within uh, the limits given uh, by our national position. And we do. And we are, we are using the space to its entirety. So our Kosovar friends are not asking, funny enough, everybody else is, but our colleagues from Kosovo know uh, how much we can, how much we do and how much we can do together. Uh, we are not immune to the development on the ground. We are very strongly in support of the belgrade pristina dialogue because we really believe that this is a game changer in the region. And I'm happy to see that the, uh, the, the government in Serbia un understood this. And I'm also happy to see that Kosovo issue did not feature prominently in, in the last uh, parliamentary elections in, in Serbia. It was not about Kosovo, it was about European perspective. So I think we are all uh, on a good track. And uh, let's ask the questions when the right time comes. But this is certainly not a problem. And uh, I would also add one last sentence that Kosovo is facing many challenges, but I'm absolutely certain that none of these challenges stems from the fact that five EU member states have not recognized it. So the answers to the problems Kosovo is facing lie in Kosovo, within the Kosovo territory, no out outside of it. And we are doing our best to help uh, deal with these challenges. The first question about Roma community, it is a serious problem, not only in my country, but also in my country. We are honestly trying to do our best. Uh, we have not been very successful, and when we, I say we, then I would refer to all the political representations in my country for at least last 30 years, or as far as I remember. It has nothing to do with the, this or that government. There have been uh, different approaches, uh, and honestly, none of them has worked greatly. So uh, we are trying to learn from the successful models, but I don't see many because uh, there either is a Roma community and then there, there, there is a problem how to accommodate it and in, integrate it within the society on, or there is no Roma community. And then, of course, uh, it's difficult to listen to advices coming from the countries who have not experienced this problem. So I will appreciate any piece of good advice you may have uh, on this because uh, we are the ones who are feeling this problem. We are the ones who are suffering from the problems. Uh, and we are the ones who are dealing with the problems. Uh, to uh, the second part of your question, I really have to very strongly object to what you refer to because I, as a member of the government, I can say f f with full responsibility there are no atrocities uh, committed in my country uh, against the immigrants, uh, let alone torture or mistreatment. We are members of the Council of Europe, of uh, European Union, and of course we are bound by all the international conventions. I have not found any reference to any of the things you have mentioned in any of the documents dealing with my country. So uh, I am surprised to hear uh, this assessment and I uh, would like to ask you to verify your data uh, because I, I'm, I have the feeling that uh, we are not speaking about the same country here. Sir, if I'm allowed to say... uh, um, Mr. Chowdhury, give the foreign minister an opportunity to respond. Huh? We what are your question. We are regularly assessed by the relevant UN bodies and, of course, by, by the Council of Europe and uh, by everybody else. And there are things uh, where I know we, we need to improve, but uh, I've, uh, for all these years I've been in this business, uh, I've never been confronted with the accusations you've just presented here. Uh, so let's us talk uh, after this, so we don't take time of the, everybody else in this room, but I would like to hear more 
uh, from you about your sources. And uh, search, sorry for misspelling your <laughs> first name, <laughs> it's probably for knowing you too, too long. Uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. <sighs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. Uh, okay, I'll try to to give you a, a short answer. First of all, Bosnia Herzegovina is not yet within the range of the pooling effect of the European Union because all the countries in the region are already there. Uh, different orbits, but they are clearly moving towards the, the, the membership. Bosnia-Herzegovina is still immune to this effect, so we have to help the country to get there so that the process will start working. Because as I said in my presentation and, and as I've witnessed uh, in my own life, in my own country, it's the process that counts. It's the process that changes the country. It's the process of building the European Union in your country. Uh, so this is what is crucial. It's, the membership comes at the very end is as a recognition of the work you've done. But how to make this critical step to bridge the, the gap between where Bosnia and Herzegovina is now and where the European Union uh, soft power works? I'm confident that European Union has done all we could. And I, I do not accept calls or even complaints from some of politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina that EU should do more. As I said in my presentation, homework can only be done at home. So we have tried, we have tried through Sadej Finci, we have tried, but there are limits. I mean, we can, there are standards. European Union is about, you cannot push Europe, uh, any, anyone into the European Union. You cannot impose European Union membership on anyone. They have to demonstrate that they are committed, which they are failing to do constantly. And this brings me to the second part of my answer. It's about the role of the international community. Bosnia-Herzegovina was not born by itself, it was born by the will of the international community, and therefore we should be aware of our responsibility vis-a-vis -vis that country. And, I mean, I spent my time in Bosnia-Herzegovina being the high representative of, of the international community. My predecessor told me that he spent as much as 75% of his time in Bosnia-Herzegovina dealing with the international com community rather than with his partners in Bosnia-Herzegovina. This speaks for itself. Uh, it's not possible to be successful as an international player when one partner is accusing you of being going too far and the other relevant partner is telling you that you didn't go far enough. That means we shall have a discussion among the stakeholders on the side of the international community what it is, what we expect from Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, what exactly we want them to do, and then we shall approach them together. European Union being in the lead, no one questions that, that's important. But the other stakeholders, particularly the US, Turkey, Russia, Serbia, Croatia, I think these are the key players. And unless there is an agreement b between these key players about the next steps, we will fail, as we have failed uh, since, for, for most of the last, certainly since the fail of the April package in 2006. Because we, there have been different initiatives coming from one or two international partners, but not being supported by other relevant partners. And this has no chance to stand. So while my suggestion is that right now Bosnia-Herzegovina is uh, preoccupied with, well, now it's the floods, for which I'm really sorry. But the politicians are now thinking only about the parliamentary elections in October, even though the, the elections will reproduce the same uh, government because there are no other, other parties. Uh, but while they are thinking about their re-election, we shall be thinking about what we will tell them, we expect from them. And I think we, we have a couple of months uh, time, window of opportunity would be good if we use it. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister Lajcik, for taking time out of your very busy uh, schedule to be with us uh, this afternoon. You've made a compelling case for the benefits of European enlargement based on concrete political and economic facts uh, as well as uh, moral values. And I would also add that we particularly appreciate the refreshing candor with which you have responded to the questions which I posed and the questions uh, from the audience. 
there will be, as you say, an opportunity to continue the dialogue in the reception, uh, which will follow next door, and I invite the audience to that reception. But for now, please join me in thanking uh, Foreign Minister Lajcik very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really great.